this is lesson two, Achilles and Odysseus. We're going to talk about the ending of the Iliad, the resolution, and then we're going to talk about some of the important sections of the Odyssey, including the Lotus Eaters and the Cyclops. Yesterday, we covered the climax of the Iliad where Achilles kills Hector. Today, we're going to consider what comes from that. The first thing that comes from that is Zeus throws a rainbow over the battlefield. This is like God throwing a rainbow over the waters in the story of Noah's Ark. The rainbow symbolizes the resolution of war by peace. It tells us that the main conflict is over, and now we're in the resolution. Zeus sends down the rainbow messenger Iris to melt Achilles' rage. The vehicle of this pacification is Priam, king of Troy, the father of Hector, whom Achilles killed. The whole poem has been about Achilles' anger, as we're told in the first line. Now he's finally going to let go of that anger through empathy. King Priam wants to get his son's body back from the Greeks. With the help of the gods, Priam infiltrates Achilles' camp. There, as he says, he endures what no one on earth has ever done before. I kiss the hands of the man who killed my son. This is considered one of the most moving scenes in all of Western literature. In the ancient world, it was a real tearjerker, with Priam and Achilles both weeping in the scene, and probably the audience weeping too, as it listened to these lines. This is what's known as... Catharsis, the process of releasing and thereby providing relief from strong or repressed emotions. Homer is very clear on how this process works. Achilles is made to walk in Priam's shoes, to feel things from his perspective, and more than that, Achilles translates Priam's feelings into his own life. Priam begs him, remember your own father. And Homer tells us, those words stirred within Achilles a deep desire to grieve for his own father. He gently took the old man's hand, filled with pity now for his gray beard and gray head. Overpowered by memory, both men gave way to grief. Priam wept freely for man-killing Hector, throbbing, crouching before Achilles' feet. Achilles wept for himself, now for his father, now for his dead friends once again. Their sobbing rose and fell throughout the house. So, as a result of this catharsis, Achilles is a changed man. The day before this, he's abused Hector's corpse, dragging it around the walls of Troy from his chariot. Now he regains his decency and humanity, and he treats the corpse with extra care. He sets aside capes and a finely woven shirt to shroud Hector's body when Priam bore him home. Then Achilles called the serving women, bathe and anoint the body. Priam must not see blood on his son. Achilles lifted Hector in his own arms and laid him down onto the sturdy wagon. Then he clasped the old king by the wrist to free his heart from fear. So Achilles has gone from being a bloody killer to a healer of the hearts of his enemies. In this way, just like Priam, Achilles too does what no one on earth has done before, as Homer says. This pathfinding, this note of novelty, is a key motif in Western heroism and excellence. We see it here for the first time in the Iliad, and 27 centuries later we see it in the famous Star Trek tagline, to boldly go where no man has gone before. And this adventurous journeying through the unknown becomes the whole basis of Homer's other great book, The Odyssey, which we'll turn to now. Let's look first at this section where Homer introduces Odysseus, the man of twists and turns. There's an important statement there about personal responsibility, one of our great themes. In fact, it's probably the earliest statement of this theme. Homer says, Men blame their miseries on the gods, but men themselves, by their own bad choices, make themselves miserable. Those lines express a whole worldview, a whole theory of human nature. Human nature is choice. When humans make bad choices, they blame external systemic forces like divine supremacy. And we'll see two contrasting theories of government grow from the soil of this worldview or from the attempt to deny it. One theory, which we today call conservatism, blames us for our bad choices but hopes to help us choose better. The other theory, which we today call progressivism, makes excuses for our bad choices blaming systemic forces or other surrogate gods. But let's get right into the adventures of Odysseus. As he sails home from Troy on this fantastic journey, he comes first to the island of the Lotus Eaters. The people there eat this mellow fruit and flower, and anyone who eats this honey-sweet fruit loses all desire to do anything except just keep staying there, grazing on lotus, and forgets what he's supposed to do. This is a symbol of something that's part of the human condition. What does that remind you of today? Scrolling on a smartphone is like being in the land of the Lotus Eaters. Many things can distract you in life. Some of the people who went to fight for the United States in the Vietnam War went over to Asia and they got addicted to drugs, they got addicted to heroin, and they got involved with Native women, and they just said, I don't feel like coming home. So no one knew what happened to them. They were missing in action and they never returned from the war. A general in the Pentagon called these people the Lotus Eaters. They went to Asia and they never came back. But then, sort of like Odysseus, 20 years later, some of these people did come back. They'd been deviated from their task by temporary pleasures. 
So I think we all need to watch out for what the lotus is in our lives. When I have a book to write, many things can become the lotus that I eat instead of writing my book. Because sometimes doing what you're supposed to do is difficult, so you do what feels easy instead. Now let's talk about the most famous part of the Odyssey, this episode with the Cyclops. It's a masterpiece of storytelling, but it also holds a lot of philosophical and political meaning. It frames certain themes that will come up again for the next 27 centuries. First of all, let's be clear what these Cyclops creatures symbolize. They symbolize humanity in its uncivilized state, the state of nature. They don't have law or government. Homer calls them lawless brutes, deaf to justice. They have no meeting place for counsel. Up on the mountain peaks they live in arching caverns, each a law unto himself, ruling his wives and children, not a care in the world for any neighbor. They don't respect religious or moral norms. As one of them tells Odysseus, We Cyclops never blink at any god. We've got more force by far. I'd never spare you in fear of God. They don't have technology or trade. They lack the artisans who would have made this island, too, a decent place to live in. They have no ships, no shipwrights there to build craft, to trade with other men. They don't have agriculture. They never plant with their own hands or plow the soil. They haven't developed the island or exploited its abundant natural resources. In general, they live in the moment without forethought, trusting to nature to provide for them. But these cyclops are not the noble primitives we will later meet in Western literature after Columbus. Homer calls them violent, savage, filthy criminals, shameless cannibals. Polyphemus, the cyclops who traps Odysseus and his men, sleeps on twigs in a cave covered with crap. Homer emphasizes that Polyphemus is not a political animal. He never mixes with others, a grim loner dead set in his own lawless ways. Here is a piece of work by God, a monster. Now, this picture of the Cyclops is important for several reasons. It's an exercise in what postmodern academics would call othering. It's a sketch of cultures which Western people considered uncivilized and therefore suitable for conquest. It's a portrait of the people which Europeans will come to call barbarians. At the same time, it's almost a polar negative of how the Greeks do themselves, and of what they regard as human excellence. And the key contrast comes on the issue of this great Western theme, forethought. Where the Cyclops live in the moment, Odysseus plans ahead. He constantly considers the consequences of his actions. He deliberates. My wits kept weaving, weaving, cunning schemes, life at stake, monstrous death staring us in the face. I thought at first to steal up to him, but fresh thought held me back. If we killed the Cyclops, how could we move the massive boulder to escape the cave? So we lay there groaning, waiting dawn's first light. Finally, as Homer says, one plan struck Odysseus's mind as best. He gets Polyphemus drunk, and then his men sharpen a log and heat the tip in the fire. And then we get this graphic cinematic piece of descriptive writing, what a film director would call a money shot. Hoisting that stake with its stabbing point straight into the monster's eye, they rammed it hard and bored it round till blood came boiling up and the broiling eyeball burst. Its crackling roots blazed and hissed. The monster wrenched the spike from his eye and out it came with the red geyser of blood. So the civilized man gets the best of the savage because he has forethought. But there are a few other points I'd like to make about this episode before we move on. First, Odysseus here shows the first example of what we might call situational or consequentialist ethics. He stands up for conventional morality in this scene especially on issues like guest friendship. But then he lies to a liar. Because the Cyclops deceives him, he deceives the Cyclops. This is like the later case of lying to the Nazis when they knock on your door asking if you are harboring Jews. People who don't treat others morally can't expect moral rules to protect them. Second, like Theseus and Thersites, Odysseus shows Parisia. He speaks truth to a more powerful opponent. After the Cyclops eats two of Odysseus's friends, Odysseus denounces him. You barbarian. What you've done outrages all that's right. Then later, as the Cyclops barrages them with boulders, Odysseus shouts, Your filthy crimes came down in your head, you shameless cannibal, daring to eat your guests in your own house. Finally, Odysseus caps the scene by attaching his own name to this truth-speaking. Cyclops, if any man in the face of the earth should ask who shamed you, say Odysseus, raider of cities, he gouged out your eye. And this self-naming is very important for a couple of reasons. First, because the capacity to speak in one's own name was a distinguishing feature of the right to parousia or free speech that came with Greek citizenship. So Odysseus is asserting in the face of the savage the rights that belong to him as a member of the civilized community. It's this stubborn, entitled assertion of civilized rights that lands Odysseus in trouble with the Cyclops in the first place. Because when he first comes to the cave and his men want to leave before the Cyclops returns, Odysseus insists on staying there to see what gifts the Cyclops will give him because civilized protocol requires that hosts give gifts to guests.
But now, the civilized assertion of his name will deepen his trouble with the Cyclops, because once the Cyclops knows who he is, he can call on his father Poseidon to punish Odysseus. And these punishments will complicate and delay Odysseus's journey home and result in many misadventures. So there's a lesson here about speaking truth to power. If you speak the truth, you must fight the power. Odysseus talks to talk, and because of that, he spends the rest of the story walking the walk. Finally, this self-naming is important because it underscores the importance of forethought. Because in naming himself, Odysseus shows a lack of it. He lapses. He lets himself be ruled by emotion instead of deliberating. As he himself says, his men could not curb his fighting spirit, so he spoke in anger. He doesn't think about the consequences of this speech act. This turns out to be his fatal flaw, and he pays for it with the years of adversity and with the lives of his men.